Well, good morning, good morning. We're so excited to have you with us, whether you're in person or watching online. So very excited to have you with us today. We're going to uh, worship the Lord our God today, for He is so good. Why don't you stand to your feet if you're here with us in person? If you're watching online, you can stand with us as well. We're going to open up in a word of prayer and just invite God to speak to us this morning before we, we give Him the praise He deserves. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. And Lord, we choose to worship you today. We choose to give you thanks. Lord, for the many blessings you've given us. Lord, you have blessed us with shelter. You've blessed us with food. You've blessed us with clothing, Lord. You've blessed us with so much more. We've got family and friends. Lord, we have so much to be grateful for. And Lord, we choose right now. We choose to acknowledge all that you have done good in and around our lives. And Father, we just pray and ask. We just pray and ask that you would speak to us. Speak to us revealing who you are. That we may continue to understand you more. And experience the benefit of a relationship with God Almighty. With the maker of heavens and earth. With the greatest individual that one can have a relationship with. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity in front of us. So speak to us and take your rightful place within our lives, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I don't know about you, but I'm just so thankful for the Lord. Aren't you? He's so good. Let's do something. As we uh, begin to worship the Lord this morning, let's just turn to somebody beside us and let's just say one thing that God has done for us. Can you just turn to one person? And just acknowledge one thing that he's done for us. Let's worship him. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. The Nazarene And wonder how He could love me A sinner condemned unclean How marvelous Sing how marvelous How wonderful And my soul Shall ever be how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made his very own. He bore my burdens to Calvary and suffered and died alone. That's something to be thankful for. last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous Ah! 
you appreciate his love for you can you in your own words just thank him for what he's done Lord we worship you today we worship you today how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope sing hallelujah sing hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me let's sing that again then came the morning then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me and oh jesus yours is the victory yes hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus 
trust Christ, my living hope. See how they lose. Praise the one who set me free. How they lose. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. My living hope, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are your heart living hope. Lord, we worship you today. You are living hope. You are living hope, and today we give you thanks for that. That we have a living hope, a hope that does not fail us, a hope that has never wavered. Our hope is in a person who has never failed. Our hope is a, in a person who, who does not have a lack of resources. And God, we come before you right now to acknowledge our hope is in you. Not in our plans, not in someone else's plans, except yours. Lord, we worship you. We worship you, Lord Jesus. You are good. You are so good to us, Lord. We worship you today. Sing this one more time. Sing hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ. My living hope, oh God, you are our living hope. Can you give God praise one more time and just thank him for who he is? He is so good. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. As you're seated, I wanted to take a quick moment and just share how good God is. But before I do, would you just turn to somebody real quick and one more time, would you just tell them God is good? Can you just find somebody and just say, God is good? Amen, amen, and amen. God is good. His mercies endure forever. You know, it's so good to be in the presence of the Lord our God and I'm just so thankful for who he is and what he continues to do in and around our life. We're so grateful we've, um, <clears throat> we, we, we didn't get to do it today. And so for those who are watching online at the nursing home, we're sorry we couldn't make it work today. We're in the process of, of getting this set up, but we started last week um, having service back in one of our local nursing homes. And uh, it was exciting for uh, everyone to kind of get together and connect. So we had a volunteer go out last Sunday and uh, lead a service over there uh, for, um, for us. And uh, they had such a great time and it was such a good, refreshing time for them. And so those of you who are at the nursing home or assisted living facility today and uh, we couldn't be there, we want to say sorry, but uh, look forward to being with you guys next week and look forward to connecting again in person. But uh, I just want to say I'm so thankful for each and every single one of us. So many people connect and uh, it's such a, a privilege to connect um, in, in the ways that we do, again, each and every single week from your offerings to your gifts of food for our food pantry to gift cards that you provide um, so that we can get food pantry needs and, and, and diapers and different things at different times. It's such a blessing. And I just want to say thank you once again for all that you have done and uh, all that you are continuing to do. 
And I also want to say thank you for joining us this past Friday. Um, we had a prayer time here, and um, I, I wasn't able to be at this first one, but uh, we had a great group of people here just to pray. And uh, we shared in prayer, we shared in needs with each other, and it was great to be able to pray for one another and connect. And so um, God is answering prayers, and it is such a privilege to see the hand of God at work. It's such a privilege to be able to see the hand of God at work. In fact, Scripture says in the book of Acts, the early church, one of the things that made them so effective is when they met and prayed together, when they were meeting and praying together, they saw the hand of God move, and the, and the work of God <laughs> caused the church to grow. And, uh, you know, church growth is not, um, church growth is, is not the point of what we try to do as a church. It is to know God, to allow God to work in our lives. But one of the results of God having his rightful place is God moves in our lives and through our life, and the church is impacted. And I'm so very grateful um, for how the church moves and, and works. And so I just want to say thank you, as uh, always. And so if you're giving online, I want to share that in, in, in the next week or so, I'm going to be sharing about a couple of really uh, unique things. First of all, we have updated our giving platform, and I wanted to, you to know this. If you go online and you want to give, we have a new platform. So if you've noticed that, if you've been giving online, just want you to see that that platform is our new platform. And for those of you who would like to give, I'm going to be sharing a few other details in the weeks to come um, about how you can give and, and different ways we can give. We actually have a phone number that you can actually text to give now. And uh, there's a lot of people that are trying to give at different capacities. And uh, we... We are reaching uh, donations from people within the church, but we're also reaching donations from people outside of the church so that we can serve within our community. And so we are expanding our means of being able to give for that purpose. So just wanted to share that with you, and I'll be, again, sharing more about that um, in a short time. But uh, before we, we go into that, I just want to say thank you, as always. Um, for all the ways you give. This time I'm going to uh, dismiss our children for their class. Our children are going to be heading down for their class, our younger ones. Our older ones have already met this morning. And uh, so we have a couple of children's classes now, but uh, they are, um, the older ones are meeting before service and the younger ones are meeting during our service. And it's a, it's a great time. And I just, I know they're heading downstairs, but I can't thank Miss Tara enough for all of the work she's putting in. She's having to create two lessons <laughs> Two lessons. She's having to create two lessons, one for the older kids and then one again for the younger kids. And that takes a lot of time and effort. And so I just want to thank her. So if you see her, please just let her know how much you appreciate her as she's continuing uh, to help um, teach our children within this church. I want us to um, pray one more time um, and just ask God to speak to us this morning. We're going to uh, continue to uh, look at God's word. In fact, we're starting a brand new series this morning. But what I'd like to ask us to do is just to pray and, and prepare our hearts because I believe that, that God wants to speak to us this morning in a very unique way. So let's pray. God, we thank you once again for the privilege of coming into your presence. And Lord, right now, you have spoke to us and you've revealed yourself to us. And I just pray and ask that you would um, do so once again that you would speak to us once again, that you'd reveal yourself to us once again. Lord, it is amazing to experience your presence and to feel your love and kindness. And Father, I just pray and ask right now that you would reveal your glory to us, that we would experience your love and kindness today. And Lord, that you would also challenge us because Lord, we need to be challenged. We need to, uh, to be pushed at times, Lord, so that we can... We can be who you've called and created us to be. Lord, just like any child needs to be pushed to learn how to walk, Lord, in our faith, we need to be pushed so we can grow and, and fulfill who you've called and created us to be. So, I, Father, I pray and I ask, Lord, that you would rise up inside of us and through your love teach us that we may demonstrate you to those around us and that we may experience you personally. And I pray and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We serve such a good God, don't we? Such a good God. He is such a good God to us. You know, this morning we're starting a brand new series. And this series is, is entitled, A Call 
for discernment, a call for discernment. And this, uh, this, this is a, a unique title, I understand. But in a, in a day and age where so many things are happening around us, so many changes are taking place, so many opinions are being formed, so, many, so much misinformation all around us, we need to be in a state of being spiritually discerning. There's a call for discernment, a need to know what God has to say. And sometimes that can be a little bit challenging. Sometimes that can be challenging because, let's just be honest, sometimes what God has to say is right here, but there are a whole bunch of other topics underneath what God has to say, and we're not exactly sure how that could apply. And opinions are formed, and then disagreements are made, and then we live in, in a series of challenges. Sometimes division takes place. Sometimes simple confusion arises. And so... Having the ability to discern what is right, what is right is important. Now, the word discernment is a very unique word because discernment is the act or process of exhibiting keen insight and good judgment. It is the act or process of exhibiting keen insight and good judgment. Now, that is a, a pretty broad definition. But what does that mean? Well, Charles Spurgeon helps us understand this a little bit better as he defines this a little bit more in the spiritual realm, but this certainly does apply to us in other areas of life as well. Charles Spurgeon stated that the, the, the act of discernment is not just knowing right and wrong. It's not just knowing right and wrong. Discernment causes us to know the difference between what is right and almost right. I'm going to say that again. Spiritual discernment, discernment, is knowing the difference between what is right and almost right. And that is hard at times. Can we be honest and acknowledge that sometimes we miss it? We're almost there, but we've missed it somewhere in life, right? And I want us to be encouraged by this because I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not trying to, to look at us and tr cause us to, to uh, walk through perfection because we are human beings. We mess up a lot, right? And I'm not trying to push us into guilt or condemnation for missing something from time to time. But if we're concerned about God and his ways and we're looking to God, what will naturally take place is discernment. Discernment. Now, today, as we look, jump into the series, I want to look at our associations. Not our homeowners associations, though I know that can be something of a great concern. <laughs> Right? Yeah, we have all wrestled with that one, right? But I want to talk about our associations, the things that we are connected with, because sometimes the things that we are connected with connects to something bigger, right? Things that we may not always immediately see. And if we're not careful, the things that we associate ourselves with can be connected to something that is sinful, and it's important that we understand this because though we may not necessarily be engaged in a specific act of sin, but because we are associated with that, we are contributing and participating and playing a role in it. So our associations are extremely important, and that is probably one of the biggest areas for us as followers of Christ as it relates to discernment, knowing what is right. And not just almost right. Because if we can get the things that are associated with Christ right and sin. We can live effective, purposeful lives. So today I'm going to be addressing a lot of different areas. I'm just going to go ahead and flat out say this. This message is going to start from the Old Testament and work its way all the way to the New Testament. And to the very end of the book if I get all the way through this message correctly. <laughs> And uh, in a timely manner. And we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. We're going to look at examples of sin. We're going to look at examples of pre-sin. These things associated with sin, that, something that led to a physical sin taking place. And then we're also going to look at things that are associated with something that is sinful after it happens. And how we move forward. And this is important for us to understand. Extremely important. So I want to walk into this 
uh, first acknowledging that if I address any sin, again, it's not to condemn anyone. It's not to cause guilt for anyone. We're all sinners, especially this guy right here. <laughs> I mess up a lot, and all you have to do is ask my wife. She can tell you, but please don't. She's got plenty of ammo, right? <clears throat> but I say that to not condemn you, but to help free us. Because the more we are freed from sin, the more we are free to live life with purpose <laughs> and find joy and freedom like you never before. And so I hope that this will help guide us. So, you know, um, what we associate with and who we associate with matters. I know people who associate with, with very well-known people, and because of their associations, they tend to succeed, right? You, you know someone who knows someone, and because you know someone who knows someone, you're able to get your foot in the door that you would not otherwise be able to get your foot into, right? There are good associations within our life. There are good associations within our life. And, and knowing those people and, and knowing how to uh, develop those relationships and maintain those relationships are important. Likewise, have you ever heard the phrase guilt by association? <laughs> I remember I was in high school, and I got in trouble one day. I don't know if my parents ever know, knew about this, because I, I talked to the vice principal myself. I answered the phone. I was able to field that phone call, luckily. <laughs> I didn't really get in trouble at that time, and so it, that one slid under the radar. But um, it was one of those things where um, some friends of mine and I, we decided that we were going to prank a couple of girls in high school, and we were going to toilet paper their car and do some stuff like that, just some minor stuff. But then another group of people got involved that weren't really invited, some folks that didn't like them, and they began to do some things to the car that we didn't talk about doing. And it did some damage to the car. And, and, and so I wasn't there at the time that that took place. I saw some of these other folks coming. I was like, oh, this is not good. So I left. But the damage was done. And I was guilty by association. I hadn't done the damaging part. I had just done the fun part, the part for a laugh, the part that was, was there just to, to have a little fun. But because I was involved, I had to pay the price. Just a few weeks ago, you may have heard this, but right across the street in this Walgreens in broad daylight, 1030 a.m., Walgreens was robbed, was held at gunpoint. And uh, there was an accomplice. And our video security cameras were able to catch that. But I want you to know that, that the person who was caught in the robbery was not the only person charged. It was those who accompanied them, right? And, and I think this is understandable. We, we get this, right? We, we get how this works. And this is where I really want us to kind of sit down and focus today. Because what we premeditate on, what we literally do, and then what we do as a result of some kind of sin taking place matters. Because it impacts our relationship with others and it impacts our relationship with God. This is extremely important. This is extremely important that we walk through this. So if you see somebody running out of a bank and they have a whole bunch of money, we know the Bible says that stealing is wrong, right? And all these $100 bills going off, as tempting as it may be to grab that, you know what? You could be arrested if you take it. Why? Because you're still taking something that's stolen. You may not have been the one to have stolen it to begin with, but because you're participating in it, you are associated with it that act now. So our associations play a role both physically, emotionally, and especially spiritually. And so this morning as we walk through this, I want you to see this because this matters and here's why. Any relationship that is worth having is going to have moral boundaries. Any relationship that is worth having is going to have moral boundaries around it. All right. Boundaries, boundaries that God has given us on how we relate and connect with one another. And if a relationship is important to us, then we're going to do everything possible to keep that relationship in right standing. It doesn't it doesn't look to cut corners. It doesn't look for the easy way out. It looks to do whatever it takes to build that relationship. And it understands that associating with certain things can also create some challenges, right? 
it can also create some challenges. I'm just going to give you a broad example. If somebody were to make fun of my wife's cooking and I were to just say laugh, <laughs> guilt by association, right? <laughs> if I were to do that, you guys get that, you see that. And so likewise, we have to understand that in our relationship with God and our relationship with other, others, the things we associate with are so important. It's so important. If we want justice in our life, we have to be careful what we associate with. If we want justice in our life, we have to be careful what we associate with. So God gives us moral boundaries. However, as cultures shift and change, we have to have spiritual discernment concerning those boundaries. Why? Because though there is no new sin, there are new ways to sin. Right? Though there are no new sins, there are new ways we can sin. In the early first century, you couldn't kill somebody with a gun. But now there's a new way, right? So there, is, there are new ways we can do things. And so as a culture, as a generation, we have to continually put forward discernment concerning the situations, the technology, the, the, the conditions of a society so that we know how to live right, both with God and with men around us and women around us. So again... It is so important that we take some time to understand spiritual discernment concerning the boundaries that God gives us. And again, the reason we honor these boundaries is so that we can enjoy the benefits of a relationship with God and other people. So if we're going to live right with God, we must have the spiritual discernment. And to do so, we're going to take a look at multiple examples now of God's clear moral boundaries so that we can begin to develop some spiritual discernment concerning what we associate with. Now, a very unique word in the New Testament that Paul uses often when he's talking about um, having to decide what is right and wrong is the word conscience. Paul in the New Testament again and again and again uses this Greek word to, to, you, to, to say something that was... Very well understood in that um, generation and in that time frame and with that language. But as we read in the New Testament and as we read in the Old Testament, we hear the word conscience and it may not always connect. So I wanted to take a moment and help us understand what the conscience really is because this helps us understand what we're going to walk through the, today. So the word conscience in the Greek is called sunidesis. Sunidesis. And it, you can put that on the screen. Uh, for me, uh, Kyla or, or uh, Mike, uh, Kyle, we have an amazing volunteer back there, Kyle uh, Beck. And if you see, conscience <clears throat> um, in the Greek is sunidesis, which is defined as determining what is morally right and morally wrong. And Paul would read. Paul would re reuse this word again and again and again in the New Testament. And we would see him use this, especially with the Corinthian church, because the Corinthian church was battling a lot of cultural wars. <laughs> they had a lot of cultural challenges and, and a lot of cultural issues coming inside of the church. And so Paul used this word a lot to address cultural issues that were creeping inside the church that weren't supposed to be there. And so he would talk about the conscience quite a bit. And when he uses this word, it was always meant to understand and determine what is morally right and morally wrong. But this is unique because this is not something that, that is just brought out in the New Testament. It really begins in the Old Testament. And we see it in the, the story at the very beginning in Genesis in Genesis, we see that God created the heavens and the earth. He created man and woman. He, and, and he's there. And what does he do? He gives them boundaries, right? Now, here's what I want you to understand about the boundaries that God has given us. From the very beginning, the enemy, Satan, God's enemy, our enemy, has always been at work against us. And how is he at work against us? Trying to create a skew of, uh, of God's word. 
something that is close, that is almost right, but not right. It is almost right, but not right. And what do we see at the very beginning, the first sin, the first sin that engaged was, was Satan tempting Adam and Eve to question God's word. And how does he do so? By slightly changing it. He gives them this scenario that is not exactly how God said it was going to be. I want you to avoid this tree because if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. It's a tree of knowledge, good and evil. I don't want you near it. And what does Satan do? He says, are you sure? He introduces a different culture. Are you sure that's what God meant? I think he just doesn't want you to see this. And he introduces a new idea. A new idea that is, that is almost right, but not completely. It's not, it's not that God was wrong. He says, go, oh, God was right. This is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. But it's, but it's not going to do what God said. And so he introduces this as a slight change. And so they sin. And what happens when we sin? There's separation. Anytime we break a boundary with anyone we love, isn't there tension? Isn't there tension whenever somebody breaks a boundary within us? Isn't there a lack of trust or hurt feelings as a result? That's exactly what happens. And so this would continue. This would continue throughout history. And, and so God would then turn around and, and, and there's a man named Abraham. Abraham comes along and, and Abraham believes God and trusts God. And God says, you know what I'm going to do? This world has messed up. Sin is now involved. But I am going to bless your seed. In fact, <clears throat> from your seed, I will bring salvation to the world. And so God gives a promise about this seed. Now, this is important for us. Keep in mind, the Ten Commandments have not been written yet. There's, there's some boundaries, but, but they're relational boundaries. And the Ten Commandments, God's boundaries for how to have a relationship with Him and how to have a relationship with others, they've not been formed yet. And so here comes Abraham, and here's this, this promise to Abraham. And Abraham is tested on this promise. Will you trust me with your son, your only son? And even though what I'm telling you to do, I want you to sacrifice your son. Will you trust me? And he does. He trusts God. And God stops him. And God blesses him. Now, this is important for us to understand because <clears throat> Abraham would have children and those children would have children. And eventually we'd see Joseph come along and Joseph would come over to Egypt and would save the children of Israel, would save the, the children of God. And, and through that, he would develop it. But then he would die. And then there would come along a Pharaoh that, that wasn't connected to Joseph. And now he's making an injustice. He's making an injustice. He makes the children of Israel slaves. Now I'm walking us through this for a specific reason because it is here that we begin to see a lot of things. The children of Israel are introduced to as slaves because the, the national religion of Egypt was a horrific religion. They sacrificed their children. They sacrificed their children. They believed in human sacrifice. And it doesn't take long. You can look that up on, in history books and over the internet. It's a horrific time period. And God heard the cries of the children of Israel. What happened with Moses? We know Moses sinned. He, he knew that God had raised him up. In fact, if you read scripture in, in Hebrews, you see that, that he knew what his purpose was. He did not accept his line as an Egyptian when he could have, instead he related to the children of Israel. Even though he wasn't a slave and they were, he went out and he killed a man. He committed murder, right? And, and he runs off and hides and then he gets the call from God to come back. Now I'm sharing all of this. Why? There's a reason coming up. God uses him to <clears throat> rescue the children of Israel out of Egypt. And now God establishes the law, the Ten Commandments. And through that, God begins to establish more laws, both national and moral. National laws, which would guide them as a nation, and those laws would change. And then there were moral laws that God would continue to adjust. 
as well. Sometimes, depending on the culture, depending on the, the things that were happening at that time, he would address and add more moral law because something had come in that they had not experienced yet before. And so now they're, they're getting some guidelines from God as to how they should live as they are wandering in the wilderness. And God gives them a very unique guideline, and it has to do with a person's life. God cares for and desires us to experience life. And in Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 24, God begins to give the moral direction for what should happen, not just for human life, but now he's addressing, addressing human life inside of a woman who is pregnant. And I want you to see this because this touches on areas within our culture, in our society at times, that, that can appear gray, that can, that can, if we're not careful, cause us to associate with sin. In Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 24, it says this, beginning in verse 22. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Now, I'm bringing this up. This was a national law, but this was a national law established on a moral boundary, murder. God had already given them the moral boundary. Now he was giving them a little bit of national guidelines that would shift and change a little bit, but it was still, it was still involving a moral boundary here, murder. You see, this is extremely important for us to understand that a child in the womb is a life to Jesus. It is a life to God, and it is something that we as a church should be extremely concerned of, for and over. The killing of a baby in a womb is not right. I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you how God views this in another passage of, of Scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, we see how this is, is viewed again in God's eyes as God is describing how he saw Jeremiah the prophet. Beginning in verse 5 of Jeremiah chapter 1, this is what he says. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Say, what? Before I formed you in the womb. Before Jeremiah was even conceived, God knew. We serve an all-knowing God. God knows every child that is going to be born before the child is born. And he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. In other words, before he was even conceived, God had a purpose for him. And here's what I want you to understand. For each and every single one of us here today, you have a purpose from God. You have an incredible purpose from God. God formed you with a purpose in mind. God formed you with a great plan in mind for your life. For Jeremiah, he says, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, I want you to see this and understand this because it is easy to see and look at, at things and not understand how, how, how things can work in a society and culture. But what we're beginning to see is that God is revealing to us how to shape and form our lives. And it starts with his morals, his boundaries for us. Because life is important, because he has created it, because he has purpose with it. It must start there. That is the starting point for each and every single one of us. There is a purpose in my life. There's a purpose in your life. There's a purpose in your neighbor's life. There's a purpose in your enemy's life. And if we're not careful, we can write off each other's purpose. We can write it off for selfish reasons. We can write it off. And if we're not careful, we can be told. A life doesn't matter when it does. See, I want you to understand. God has morals that he's given us to guide us through life. Let's take it a little bit further. You see, as God gives us directions and as he leads and guides us, we can see that this becomes increasingly more challenging. How do we work through this? How do we process this? How do we process this? 
Because in, in our culture, as I mentioned earlier, there are going to be things in life that aren't clearly spelled out in Scripture. And so we've got to have spiritual discernment to know how to move forward. And as we look, and as we begin to see things unfold, we can see that what God has planned is pretty clear. We just have to ask God for a little bit more direction, allow us to see a little bit further. So as we push forward, we see that some things are not acceptable to God. Things associated with sin are just not acceptable to God. In fact, in Deuteronomy, we see another passage in which God is, is giving instruction. It is not acceptable. Not everything we have and not everything that is available to us is acceptable. We'll see this even in the New Testament. But in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 18, this is what God instructs the children of Israel concerning offerings and, and paying of vows. You must not bring the earnings of a female prostitute or a male prostitute into the house of the Lord your God to pay any vow. Because the Lord your God detests them both. He detests both prostitution and the money earned from it. I want you to understand, he, he detests the sin. Why? Because it's sexual immorality. That's not a moral boundary. That's not how you have a relationship with God or someone else. God has given us amazing guidelines so that we can have a right relationship with him and other people. And when we do it his way... We find fulfillment and peace. And let me just tell you up front, if you've not done it his way in anything that I've been talking about today, you and especially anyone watching online, you've had an abortion. You, you've done something that we're going to be looking at today. I want you to know, first and foremost, there's grace. Again, I am not coming here to condemn or to cause guilt. But I want us to learn the importance of what we associate with. You see, this is so important. God doesn't just accept just anything. Not everything is acceptable before the Lord our God. In fact, we don't just see that in the Old Testament. We actually see this in the New Testament too. Judas, he betrays Jesus, right? And what happens? But he is, he is given 30 pieces of silver and he has taken these coins, these, these, these 30 pieces, and he takes them to betray Jesus. And as betray, Jesus is betrayed and he begins to see what is going to actually happen to Jesus he is overcome with remorse and guilt. And he goes back to the priests. He goes back to the temple and says, here, I did wrong. I sinned. I, 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 I sold out this individual for murder. And you know what they said? We can't take that. Why? Because just like in Deuteronomy chapter 23, where they could not accept the money that came in that was earned from a prostitute, whether male or female, they said that they could not take it. I'm going to show it to you. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 6, Matthew chapter 27 verse 6, the chief priest picked up the coins that Judas had thrown down and said, it is, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. Because this money is for the murder of somebody, a moral wrong, because this is associated with a moral wrong, sin of murder, we can't take it. It's unacceptable to God. In fact, we learned this all throughout Scripture. Jesus taught this again and again. We see Jesus say, husbands, if you don't treat your right, guess what? Your wife right, guess what? I'm not listening to your prayers. <laughs> if things that you're associated with aren't right, you aren't right with me. And that's not the only place that happens. Things that we are associated with when it's not right creates friction between us and God and us and other people. I want you to really allow this to sink in because this is so important. What did Jesus, what else did Jesus teach on? Jesus' instruction for the, for the people again and again included what we were associated with. What do you say to the man who thought of his neighbor's wife immorally? Though that he had not, again, here's the pre, the pre sin, though he had not physically committed adultery, if he thought that way about her, or if she thought that way about him, what was it? It was as if he already did it. Likewise, as also said, if you hate somebody and, and you want them dead, it, in, in that same capacity, if you think it in your mind, if you have so much hatred for somebody in your mind. 
your thoughts at that moment, have you associated with God in his sight as if you had already done it? What we associate with is sinful if it is connected to a moral wrong. It is also sinful on the backside of it. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, he teaches this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we see something very unique take place. He's having to deal with a Corinthian church that is completely surrounded by a culture, a culture that is drastically different than, than the church in Israel. They have so many cultural things happening. Uh, I mean, he's addressing in 1 Corinthians uh, just incest. He's addressing like uh, uh, alcoholics. He's addressing all sorts of sin. And one of the things he begins to dress uh, address, excuse me, he doesn't dress it up, you know, he doesn't play doll with it. He addresses <clears throat> food offered to idols. Now, this is important because this is something that's associated with idolatry. Do you see it? It's associated with idolatry. In chapter 8, he starts talking about the motive. I, I know in chapter 8, if you read it, you see Paul's language he uses the word conscious again and again, or the word that we just learned in the Greek. Soon idasis. Morally knowing wrong and right. He says this again and again. You can morally know wrong and right. And he's addressing it. And this is where he says, if I never eat meat again so that I don't cause someone to stumble, that's, I'm not going to eat it again. Why? Because he doesn't want to cause someone to stumble. Here's why. Because there are so many people gathering around and they're seeing, the, because the markets were right beside the temples, you could buy food and, and, and there's much of the food in these markets had, had been provided through the sacrifice to idols. And Paul begins to address all of these idols and, and, and the food that was sacrificed to them. And this is what he had to say. He says, think of the Jews. He says, think about what the Jews did and why they're doing this. And in verse 20 of chapter 10, he says, No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, idols, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in, the, in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. This is where discernment comes in. In a situation where you don't know what to do, what do you do? You look to God. You look at his moral boundaries. And you say, you know what? How does that impact my life? If I were to do what they were doing, would that be right? No. So should I associate with what they're doing, even if it's on the backside? And Paul says no. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 25 through 28, he instructs them in how they should move. He, he gives them some guidance, which is great guidance for us. And this is promising uh, information for us because there's a lot of gray areas. Like I said, we're going to miss it from time to time. We're going to get it wrong and, and we're going to be ignorant of some things. We're going to not have complete truth and understanding in front of us. And when we do, it's okay because there's, there's God's grace here. But here's what Paul has to say concerning those uh, I, uh, the food offered to idols. He says, verse 25, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising question of conscience. Again, of conscience, what of what is morally right and morally wrong. For the earth is the Lord's and, the, and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of being morally right or morally wrong conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifices, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of what is morally right and morally wrong. Now, why am I talking about food offered to idols? Because we don't have that happening here. No, we don't. 
It does happen around the world, but not really right here. I'm wanting you to see an example. That there is a right and wrong when it comes to things we, that are associated with sins. Things that are not acceptable to God. Things that, that, if we were just to be honest with ourselves, it doesn't please God. Now, in every relationship, we want to please the person we're in a relationship with. This is not about condemnation. This is not about legalism, just having to, to behave a certain way. This is about, look, I care about God and I want to bring honor to him. So I'm going to honor his boundaries and a relationship with him and others. This is about, I love God so much that whatever is associated with sin, I don't want it to be attached to me. Now, the good thing is, as Paul is saying here, if you don't know about it, if you're not aware of it, you're not going to be linked to it in God's eyes the same way as if you do know about it and you just ignore it. Church, we're living in a day and age where there's a lot of cultural issues rising up, a lot of questions, a lot of things that people are saying and want to say. There's a lot of information that people have that may or may not be true. And what we have to do as a church is make sure that we are lining up with things that aren't associated with sin, but are associated with God. And we're not going to always get it right. There's things in my life that I may have done that, that may have been associated with sin, but if I know it, it's another issue. Because... A call for discernment. Here's, here's the point I want you to get. A call for discernment. It's simply a call to be right. Not just right in a thought or right in an opinion. It's to be right with God. It's to be right with those around us. And if God says something, we have to be mindful of it. So here's the deal. I've had a lot of you ask me all sorts of questions, and I, I, want us, I want us to look at some examples. And we've talked about abortion being one of them. There are all sorts of an exam, examples out there of how we can participate and associate with sinful things, and we've got to be careful of it. And I'm just naming these as a few examples, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone, but I'm just trying to help us understand that there are things out there that we can associate with. And if you don't know, you're fine. But when you do know, we have to make the choice, the conscious choice. God, give me discernment, the moral ability to know right from wrong in this situation. You see, God, for instance, defines marriage, what marriage is in Scripture. That is something that is pretty clear cut. But as but as the world and culture continues to develop, there are going to be things that aren't quite clear. And what do we have to do? We have to pray for discernment and use moral truth as a guide, either pre-sinful moment or post-sinful moment. We learn that there are all sorts of things. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful because there are all sorts of topics and areas that this attaches itself to. The murder of babies. I read an article this week that there is a satanic temple in Texas suing the Texas government for the religious right for human sacrifice aborting babies. We're aware of this. Why? Because this impacts other areas. I want you to be aware. It's association. There are medicines that have aborted babies in them. And we have to be careful. Careful. Why? Because we don't want to associate with that. It's one thing if someone is an organ donor and says, I choose to give you my organs if I die. Or if, if something happens to me, it's another for a life to be taken and they're life to be forced or opened and available. 
It's one thing for like gangs to go in and, and start killing people and trying to then sell their property for profit. We wouldn't want to participate in that. If someone is just killed and their house becomes available, that wouldn't be wrong. That association is not the same. Church, we have to be careful about our associations. What we associate with matters. It matters to God. And here's why, as we close. I know this is kind of a hard message to hear, and I know this challenges us. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have all the answers. And I'm not here to point out every little thing here and there. The Bible says we have to work out our own salvation with, <clears throat> with fear and trembling. We have to look to God ourselves. But I want you to understand that looking to God does matter for this. Because if we're going to have discernment and know how to walk with the power of God in our lives, we have to understand that there are things associated in our lives that may be hindering us. So our associations affect our relationship with God and the potential for others to rightfully know God. If a relationship is important to us, then we're going to do everything possible to keep that relationship in right standing. See, a call to discernment is a call to pursuing the life that is right before God. As Charles Spurgeon said, spiritual discernment doesn't just lead us to knowing right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. The things we associate with that is somewhat wrong. We've got to be careful. There's a lot of injustice out there. There's, there's things that we can associate with, and we've got to be listening to each other as a church. We may not know it, but we may unintentionally be hurting a relationship. If we connect someone in some way that is being affected with, with, with racism, then we have to adjust so that we can love our neighbor as ourselves. We have to adjust. If we're, we're participating in something that is creating a wrong in another person's life, we've got to adjust. Because why? Associations matter. But where do we get our highest boundary? Where do we get the highest boundary for this kind of discernment? The morally knowing of right and wrong it comes from God's word. It starts with the Ten Commandments. A call for discernment is a call to reevaluate the boundaries of our relationship with God and others. So this morning, I thought it would be highly appropriate that whether you, and let's just be honest, I may have sinned and not known it. I may have participated in something that was highly sinful and did not know it. And according to Paul, you're fine because there's grace. But the moment we realize it, there has to be a response. And I want to encourage us and challenge us this morning. If we know that we're participating in something that is associated with sin, let's, for the sake of God, for the sake of God, let's change. So as I close, I, I heard this story. I read this story last night. It was a powerful story. I'm in my bed reading, and a man, his son, enlisted to go off to war. war. His name was Charlie, and, and literal name, not just kind of metaphor. <laughs> Charlie, war, you know, all of that good stuff. <clears throat> his name was Charlie. And as he is at war, his father decides, all right, I'm going to treat all the soldiers who come back from war, who are injured, hurt, whatever, I'm going to treat them the way I would want my son treated. And so he begins to love and care for every single soldier that comes in. He took them into his house. He took them not only into his house, but he would pay for their bills. He would buy them food, if necessary, buy them clothes. He did whatever it took and it was consuming his time so much so that he began to realize that his business was declining. And, and he told his wife, he said, "Hun, i I've got to go to work today. I have got to get to business. I cannot help a soldier today. I'm cutting it all off because I have to help myself. And 
And here's what happened. A soldier walked into his business that day. And the father said, I'm not doing it. And he ignored it. He ignored the fact that a soldier walked in and the soldier just stood there. And he kept working and kept working. An hour went by and he ignored the soldier. Realizing the soldier was not going to be leaving. He looks up and says, all right. I am not helping anybody right now. I have to work. He says, I have a letter for you. And the soldier gave this this guy the letter and he opens it up. And as he opens it up, he realizes that this is his son's writing. And he begins to read the letter. And he says, Dad, the gentleman who gave you this letter is one of my close friends who I have served beside He was hurt for my sake. He was hurt for my sake. He says, for Charlie's sake, will you serve him? And so for Charlie's sake, for Charlie's sake, the dad left work and took care of him. The man was dying. And he got him to his family so that he could be with his family before he ended up passing. But he took care of everything for him. And why did he do it? He did it for Charlie's sake and for the sake that that man did for Charlie. Can I tell you something? Jesus did something for us. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And for Jesus' sake... We can unassociate with some things. We can disconnect with some things for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I want to challenge us today. I want to challenge us today. For the sake of what Jesus has done for us, we can serve those around us. And we can set up some of the boundaries that God has made. So here's how I'd like us to close. As we close, I want us to to have communion. I want us to close in communion, remembering what Jesus did for you and me. Remembering what he did so that we can find life and hope. And that no matter what we have done, this is the most beautiful picture in the world. This is the most wonderful thing that we can experience. And that is the fact and the reality that no matter how bad we have sinned, nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus died, we can have life. No matter what we have associated with in the past or what we have acted on. That is why a man like that is why a man like Moses, who murdered a man, still was found next to God, who was found as a man who had faith in God. That is why King David, who had an affair and also committed uh, murder. And once again, if you look, did murder was uh, David the one who actually committed the murder? No. It was what was inside, what he associated with it was viewed as murder in God's eyes, right? But even David, even David was a man after God's own heart. And whatever you have done, wherever you have been, let me just tell you right now, you are not too far from the love of God. You can find hope, grace, strength, and for the sake of Jesus, we can live a changed life. So we're going to take communion and to prepare our hearts I'm going to ask my father to distribute communion this morning. And as he distributes it, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask that you prepare your hearts by asking God to forgive you of anything that's inside that is inappropriate. And then as you do so, we will be prepared to receive what Jesus told us to receive in remembrance of him. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you. you we thank you for your mercy and lord as we come into your presence we pray and ask that you would reveal to us the things that we are associated with and that you would reveal to us the things that have caused us to sin or may cause us to sin but lord as you do so reveal also the promises and the strength and the hope that there is as we submit and surrender to you And Lord, we ask and pray as a church and as a nation that you would forgive us.
forgive us of our sins. Forgive each and every single one of us of the sins we've committed, those we know we've committed, and even those that we've committed that we didn't realize we did so by associating with something. Lord, give us discernment so that we could walk right with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord as the elements are being distributed. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all and all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Let's make this declaration to the Lord our God. Lord, now indeed I Thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Here's why. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He Washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, he washed it white as snow 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 Oh, 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Father, we thank you for your love for us and your kindness towards us. We thank you that you washed our sins away and made them white as snow. And for Christ's sake, we choose to worship and acknowledge you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jesus, before he was put on the cross, before he died and resurrected, he had a Passover meal with the disciples, and he began to tell them, this is the new covenant for you. This is a new covenant for you, and I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And so he took the bread, and he broke it up, and he passed it out to them, and he said, take this bread, this is my body, which is broken for you. Just like Charlie's friend who took whatever explosion or bullet for Charlie, Jesus has done for us. His body was impacted for our sins. And so for that, we remember the punishment that Jesus received on account of sin, sin that we've committed. So let's take this, let's break it, and let's eat it and remember it. Lord, we thank you for the... The bread of life. We thank you for your son who took the punishment for our sins. And we thank you, Lord, that you accepted his punishment on our behalf. <laughs> thank you that we could accept his punishment and that you would accept his punishment on our behalf. Amen. Now, likewise, Jesus took the wine and, and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. And it was the blood poured out of an animal that took away the sins. And so he says, take this and remember that this is my blood that is poured out for your sins. So let's take and let's drink this now in remembrance. Lord, once again, we come before you and we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed so that we could, we could receive forgiveness of our sins and have eternal life with you and have a relationship moving forward that others could not have. One that is no longer broken or separated, but rather one that it now has freedom. We thank you, Jesus, for the shedding of your blood and for forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for this eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Are you grateful for what Jesus did? I'm grateful for what Jesus did. And what I'd like to do is encourage us to receive what Jesus did for us. There is now, therefore, no condemnation there is now no condemnation. It doesn't matter what you have done in your past. There is now no more condemnation. You don't have to feel bad about it moving forward. Why? Because Jesus took care of it. If you've confessed it and if you've changed. But the key is changing. And as God reveals the next thing, as God reveals the next thing through discernment, we can move forward and continue to live right before God for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed service today. I hope that God has touched you today. For those of you watching online, thank you for joining us. So glad to have you each and every single week, whether you're watching locally or abroad. <clears throat> we want to dismiss you first. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back online Wednesday at uh, 
6.30 p.m. It took me a minute to remember what time. 6.30 p.m. we'll be joining you as we continue our series on Wednesday night. Thank you for joining us online. God bless you. We'll see you next week.